Every one of us has dealt with worry at some point in our lives, whether we've been anxious about the outcome of a test or the life of a loved one. Worry has impacted us all. Some of our worries may be irrational and incomprehensible to others, while some may seem perfectly normal and unavoidable. No matter what you're worried about, whether it's big or small, you can give your worries and anxieties to God, and He will take them from you. Your life will begin to change when you let go of your worries and let God handle them. Philippians 4, 6-7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Let's break these verses down and examine them one bit at a time, starting with, Do not be anxious about anything. I don't know about you, but that command feels impossible to follow. But the verse tells us exactly how to do that. We'll get to that in a minute. But first, I want to stress the word anything. Notice how the verse does not specify that you shouldn't be anxious about only little things or only big things, but anything. Other people can sometimes diminish our worries by sharing their own, seemingly more important struggles. But it doesn't matter what you are worried about or whether other people think you should or shouldn't be worried. Your worry is valid, no matter what it is about, and you can take it to the Lord. When someone implies that your worry is trivial, you may think that it is not even worth taking to the Lord. But God says not to worry about anything. Even if your worry seems small, you can take it to Him, because He wants to hear about it and ease your mind. God is not like humankind. He won't judge you based on what you worry about. He won't tell you that your anxieties are too small for him to care about. He doesn't care what you worry about. He only cares that you bring it to him. So, how do we do that? The verse goes on to say, By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. The Bible talks a lot about prayer and how important it should be to Christians. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16-18 says, Rejoice always pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God wants us to pray to Him not just when we worry, but all the time. We never have to feel bad for taking our worries to God because He wants to hear about both the good things and the bad things in our lives. He cares about it all because He cares about us. He will listen to anything you have to say to Him. Psalm 102, 16-17 says, For the Lord builds up Zion, he appears in his glory. He regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despise their prayer. It doesn't matter who you are, what you have done in the past, or what you are praying about. God promises to hear you. It is not a sin to worry in the first place, but it becomes a sin if you allow your worry to fester and consume you. The only way to avoid this is by bringing your worry to the Lord and allowing Him to handle it. Notice how both the Philippians verse and the Thessalonians verse mention the importance of thanksgiving when it comes to prayer. When we approach the Lord, we shouldn't simply ask Him for what we want like a child would ask Santa for a present. While God is our Father and our friend, He is also the Creator of the universe, and He demands our respect and thankfulness. Every time you pray to the Lord, no matter what you are praying about, you must remember to give thanks to Him for listening to you. We must not take advantage of Jesus' sacrifice, which allows us to communicate with God. Jesus gave his life so that he could be the mediator between us and God. If it weren't for his actions, we would have no way to communicate with God. This is why we often end prayers with, for Jesus' sake. We must also thank the Lord for that which he has given us, even as we may ask for more. If you give a child, or even an adult for that matter, a present, you expect them to say thank you. If they never thank you, no matter how many times you give them a gift, you may stop giving them things altogether because they don't seem to appreciate your gifts anyway. But you will feel better about gifting them presents if they thank you and seem genuinely grateful to you. If we should give thanks to someone who gives us something as small as a pencil, how much more should we give thanks to the one who gave us everything we have? The Lord gave us our very lives and the world we live in. Without Him, we would not exist. We have every reason to be grateful to the Lord, even in the midst of worry, and we must remember to continually thank Him for every gift He has granted us. The last part of Philippians 4, 4-7 says, 
and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the change that we will experience when we give our worries and anxieties to the Lord. Without the Lord's peace, we will feel lost at sea, floating adrift in the middle of nowhere with no hope. But when God grants us His peace, we will feel safely anchored on land, surrounded by His presence and protection. The Lord can prevent us from feeling lost and alone. When we give our worries to Him, we are no longer alone in them. We have shared them, and so God is not only with us in our worries, but He can take them away and hold on to them for us. Psalm 55:22 says, Cast your cares on the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Jesus reaffirms this verse in Matthew 11:28 through 30 when He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you are carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders, you need only give your burden to God to walk easier and receive the rest you need. The world tells us to be independent and fight for ourselves, but the Bible tells us to rely on the Lord. We cannot endure this life on our own. We need His help to get through our worries and suffering. And He is ready and willing to help. His arms are outstretched, ready to take our burdens from our backs. If you've ever climbed a mountain with a heavy bag on your shoulders, you know the desperate feeling of wanting to relieve your burden. But in that situation, you need your bag because it carries your supplies. However, the burdens that we carry in life do nothing but weigh us down. We don't need to carry them because God is willing to do that for us. Imagine a strong man walking beside you up the mountain, carrying your bag to make it easier for you to climb without the extra weight. The climb will be much easier and faster without that burden. Our lives will be easier without the burdens that we carry. Instead of viewing your life as a seemingly endless struggle, you will find more pleasure in it. Your life will change dramatically when you let God take it over. You will still encounter worries, but you will know what to do with them. Instead of allowing them to take over, you will give them to God and simply carry on in the peace the Lord will give you. Your eyes will be open to the pleasures of life when you are not encumbered by a heavy burden. You will spend more time enjoying life and being happy when you are not weighed down with worry. You will be confident in your future because you know that God has everything under control. In the book of Jonah, God commanded Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach destruction against the people. But Jonah didn't want to. He was anxious about how he would be treated there, and he decided to run away from God's instruction instead. He allowed his fears and anxieties to replace his faith in the Lord. As a result, the ship that he boarded faced a terrible storm, and the crew threw Jonah overboard. God sent a whale to swallow him, and Jonah lived in the belly of the whale for three days. During that time, he repented of his sin and vowed to go to Nineveh and do as God commanded. Not only did Jonah travel to Nineveh safely, but his preaching saved the people from God's destruction. They repented of their sins as a result of God's warning through Jonah, and God granted them forgiveness. Jonah nearly allowed his anxiety to get the best of him, but God wouldn't allow it. He guided Jonah back onto the path he laid out for him, and he took Jonah's burden from his back. He looked after him in Nineveh, and hundreds of lives were saved. Whatever you worry about, whatever anxieties you have, take them to God. God wants you to take every single worry to Him, no matter how big or small. He will listen to whatever you have to share with Him, and in return, He will grant you His peace. He will lift your burden from your shoulders and walk beside you in the pleasures of life. And don't forget to thank the Lord for all He has given you all that He does for you. As Psalm 68, 19 says, Praise be to the Lord, to our God, our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. Go to the Lord for anything and everything, and watch how your life will change for the better. Receive the peace and protection of the Lord day after day, and be encouraged for the future, no matter what it may hold. Worry will never stop being a part of our lives, and we can't control it. But we can control how we react to it. We can let it overwhelm us and take over, or we can give it to God and rest easy. Many of us are at the point where we are just waiting for the year to end. It's been a tough one. 
At least a number of people around me have told me so. It was filled with ups and downs, so many struggles, and at this point, very few people are optimistic that something can happen before the year ends and transform their lives for the better. So, we try again next year. That is what we have resolved to. Perhaps you relate to this. It has been such a long time trying to put your life in order, but everything has just been heading south. Your plans never materialize, and every time you end up in a worse state, you feel so downtrodden and helpless, like there's just no more fight in you. This is why I have come in to tell you that you do not need to fight. The reason you are feeling so exhausted is you have been trying to plan your life on your own. You left God out of the picture, and as his child, this should not be the case. God doesn't want to be a third wheel in our lives. He should be the priority. The kind of friend who when they say they are not going to an event, you don't either. And when they pass by your house and tell you to hop in the car, you do not ask where you're going. However, in our spirit of self-sufficiency and independence, we tend to sideline God. We take over his place in our lives. We start to fight battles that were none of our business in the first place. We push God farther and farther away until he has no choice but to let us stray as far as we will. This never ends well. Life is not yours to do alone. God wants to be with you each and every step. He wants to be your companion, friend, comforter, and a shoulder to lean on. He wants to be the one fighting your battles for you. It's his work, not yours. Your only duty is to trust him and let him do his thing. There is no way to avoid the troubles of life. As long as we are here, they will always be there. The Bible says in John 16, 33, that in this world, we will face troubles. This means that challenges of all kinds will find their way into your life. However, as a child of God, you should not despair or feel helpless. God will always fight your battles. He always has and always will. He has proven to be faithful throughout scripture, through several men like Joshua, Elijah, King David, and King Josiah. There is one who has a particularly fascinating narrative about choosing to trust and worship in the face of overwhelming odds that is, King Jehoshaphat, king of the southern side of Judah. This particular story about Jehoshaphat is told in 2 Chronicles 20. King Jehoshaphat is surrounded by three vast armies and a war is looming. The impending invasion and destruction of his kingdom threatens him. But his response to this is very fascinating. Instead of gathering together all his army men and getting ready for war, this king gathers all his people together to pray and worship the Lord. He humbles himself in prayer and cries out to God, telling him about the difficulty they are about to endure from the surrounding nations. And then he says this in verse 12, O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. ESV. What faith in God? How many times do you acknowledge that you do not know what to do, but your eyes are on the Lord? How many times when you're in difficulty, do you look up to the Lord to help you? Many times we are so intent on saving ourselves that we forget about the existence of God in our lives. We are so filled with the me, myself and I mentality that God no longer has the opportunity to reveal his power through us. This is not what Jehoshaphat does. He could have gathered his men for war or even looked for help from the allies he had among the surrounding nations. But instead, 
he chose to seek the help of God. God responds to Jehoshaphat by speaking through one of the Levites present in the gathering, saying, Thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid, and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Verse 15, ESV What a relief to know that God is fighting for us. We need not gather our armies. We need not seek the help of our friends, train endlessly, getting ready for the upcoming war, or even fight it, because it's not our battle, but the Lord's. The people of Judah devoted their energy to worshiping the Lord, and in return, he fought the battle for them. When they went to the battleground, they were met by an incredible sight. Verse 24 says, When Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness, they looked toward the horde, and behold, there were dead bodies lying on the ground. None had escaped. While the people of God were worshiping him, he set out against the three armies, turning them against one another so that they fought and killed each other. By the time the people of God arrived, there was no battle left to fight. It was finished. God had won. We will find ourselves in many battlegrounds in this life, Perhaps when you became born again, you hoped that it was the end of your suffering. Perhaps you thought that now that you were a child of God, no one would touch you. You had suffered so much in the hands of the world, and now you could not wait to relax and rest in the Lord. This had to be the mentality that the Israelites had when Moses rescued them from bondage in Egypt. That the end to their painful existence had come and now it was the time to rest and lavish in the land of milk and honey. But when we read the books that tell the history of the Israelites, you will notice that promise was far from near. It was now time for the real war. In fact, the first thing they had to do was gather their army and go to war against the city of Jericho, then the city of Ai, and then one by one, they fought all the other cities of Canaan. This happens to us as well. We come into the Lord to rest, but sooner or later, we realize that the Christian life is not a playground, but a battleground. We are attacked endlessly from all fronts. We do not fight each other or our fellow believers, but against Satan, the grip he has on the people all around us and his attempts to try to defeat us and our efforts to build God's kingdom. In Ephesians 6.12, Paul writes, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The contemporary English version says, We are not fighting against humans. We are fighting against forces and authorities and against rulers of darkness and powers in the spiritual world. When you study the scripture, you will realize that this is a war that has been ongoing for generations, the opposition between good and evil. It has been there from the beginning of time. Even though sometimes we will ultimately be drawn into this fight, we must not forget that the battles belong to the Lord. It's his to fight and the victory is already his. Jesus Christ triumphed over sin and the powers of darkness when he died and rose, conquering Satan and all his works. God has your back in all battles, whether they manifest in your job or family, or whether it's battles against temptation, thoughts of worry and depression, mental or physical health or spiritual ones. He is on the battleground not as a spectator, but as the one on the front line. He is fighting for you. This battle is his to fight and win. Whatever difficulty or struggle you are experiencing in life, you have a choice at all times to react in fear or run. You can choose to do everything within your own power to take care of your situation and try to keep it under your control 
or you can pack up and leave, running away and staying far ahead of the danger. You can freeze up and be overrun by the evil that sits before you, or you could lift your eyes and hands to heaven in the battle and worship God knowing that He is fighting for you. You can rest in the assurance that He has overcome the world and all its evil. You can choose to keep your hope in the Lord, knowing that He is greater than anything you can ever face in this life. There is no challenge in your life that is too big or too small for Him to handle. He has a way out for each and every thing that could be troubling you. Jesus Christ has already decisively won the battle on the cross. However, we must still continue to resist the enemy and all his schemes. Even though we do so, we must always remember that we are fighting an enemy who has already been defeated. As soon as Christ's nail-pierced resurrected feet touched the earth outside the tomb, he secured a victory over sin and death for all of us, and we are assured of a day when he will come again and put an end to all of this. He will put our enemies under his feet, overcoming them forever, and the dust of this battle will settle, and we will be welcomed to a renewed and peaceful world. Until then, we must strive to flee from all evil. Even though this battle is not our own, we are involved in it by virtue of being the children of the light. We are greatly impacted, but are not to feel defeated because God will never send us to battle alone. He is always with us, fighting for and with us. God is the Lord of heavenly armies who fights for his people. He is a warrior who fought for his people in the days of King Jehoshaphat and he still fights for his people because his faithful love endures forever. He is enthroned upon our praises, and his power and wisdom are as close as our prayers. All the battles in our lives belong to him. With God, there is nothing impossible. It might look impossible to you. It might look unbearable. It might look like a dead end. Don't forget that God said he would make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. He honors his word more than his name. The situation might look like a desert to you. It might have gotten so bad that you've given up hope that it will ever get better. Don't forget it was God that brought rain to the earth after three and a half years of drought, gave Sarah, Hannah, and Elizabeth children after decades of barrenness. That thing is not impossible with God. The loss you took in your business, career, family, investments, etc. might not be as bad as the state of things at the Valley of Dry Bones. In Ezekiel chapter 37, God took Ezekiel through a valley full of dry bones. This was a lifeless and hopeless situation. God ensured Ezekiel saw the depth of the problem before he commanded him to prophesy. Ezekiel prophesied as God commanded, and God, the Restorer, worked what only he could do. He made every bone return to its bone, then added new flesh to the bones. Ezekiel saw they had new flesh, but something was still missing. They had no breath, thus they were lifeless. God commanded him to prophesy again, and the breath came into their nostrils. The valley that was once filled with bones became filled with a great army. That is what God can do. Ezekiel simply prophesied as he was commanded, and he watched the mighty hand of God bring a new beginning into that hopeless situation. God can and will do the same for you if only you believe in him. There is a name God has called, the Restorer. I've realized God has a name in every circumstance. When you need help, he is your helper. When you need deliverance, he is your deliverer. When you need restoration, a fresh start, and a break from all the troubles, He is the Restorer. All you have to do is go to Him. He said, call unto me and I will answer you. He is waiting to hear your call for help. He wants you to ask for the restoration and watch Him restore everything you've lost. Look at the life of Jesus while He walked on the earth. 
Everywhere he went, he saw that things were not how they ought to be. He never left them like that. Jesus took it upon himself to restore things to the way they ought to be. We need not forget that his whole purpose on earth was still because of restoration. He came to restore man to their creator, to bridge the gap between man and God, to pull down the middle wall of partition, to remove the barrier the fall of Adam brought and to bring man into fellowship, sonship, and oneness with the Father. Can you number how many times God restored the Israelites every time they went after other gods? God is patient and meticulous about this business of restoration. Man is important to him, which is why he rules in our affairs. Call the restorer to come into your affair today. When you call him, he'll hear you. He will bring back all that the enemy has stolen from you. The thief comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. That is the devil's goal, and he's been faithfully doing that. But God has not stopped thwarting his plans. He's not stopped making an open shame of him and causing him to fail woefully in his attempt to frustrate the children of God. Beloved, God has not forgotten you. He has not given up on you. He's not left you to find the way for yourself. He has not abandoned you. He is interested in your case. He'll make a way for you in the wilderness. He will do more for you now than at your beginnings. He said in Joel chapter 2, verses 25 through 27, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locust and the young locust, the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you'll praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. That is what he is going to do. God doesn't make empty promises. He doesn't say things he can't do. Everything he has promised, he will do. As awesome and wonderful as God's plans for you are, you need to believe them. The question to you is, do you believe him? Will you trust his promises? Will you receive comfort through his word? God gives beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. God makes all things beautiful. The power of God is there to restore you to who you ought to be. No matter how broken you are, God can restore you to who he has made you to be. No matter how battered, wasted, and exhausted you are, God can restore hope, joy, and strength to your life. He can hold your hand and pull you out of that state of depression, addiction, and frustration. He can do it, and He wants to do it. That is why He is called the Almighty God. He cares for you. It doesn't bring Him any delight to watch you in any position that doesn't bring glory to His name. God could not sit still and allow the devil to destroy man. He had to step in and he brought redemption. He destroyed every plan of the devil to frustrate redemption, and in the end, we became children of God. The matters of your life are still important to God. He won't stop until you fully represent what he had in mind when creating you. Remember the story of David when the Amalekites invaded his camp and took all he had, including his wives and the wives of his companions. He inquired from God if he should pursue, do you know what God told him? God said he should pursue and he would recover all. Just as God said, it happened. David recovered everything the enemy took from him. God hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. As he told David ages ago, he's saying to you now, you will recover all. If only you could believe him as David did. If only you could pursue as David did. The problem with believers today is that we often read the Word of God, but our hearts are too occupied with many things for us to fully believe and watch the Word come to pass in our lives. The Word of God is powerful. The promises of God are reflections of God's abilities and love for us. Oh, that you would believe the Word of God today. Oh, that you would build your faith through the Word of God. Oh, that you will run with everything God has promised you. Speak the Word of God over your life, over your situation today. There is power in the Word of God. 
Don't resign yourself to faith like those who have no hope. The creator of the universe, the restorer of the paths, the builder of the bridge, and the way maker is your father. He will restore you back to where you ought to be. Your sadness and depression might be a result of what you have done. Despite the mercies of God you have seen in and around your life, you often find yourself doing despicable things. Because you know they are not what you ought to do, the devil has built a tent around that and he is causing guilt to eat you up and weigh you down. Beloved, look up! That is the hand of God right there, reaching out to you in your low state. No matter how low down or far away you are, the hand of God is long enough to reach the lowest valley and the deepest pit. He will pull you out, clean you up, and set you right where you ought to be. The question is, will you let him? Will you surrender and allow the restoring power of God to work in your life? Will you allow him to give you hope? Or do you want to continue with your hopelessness? Will you take the good health he wants you to have? Or are you comfortable with your failing health? The answer lies with you. Oftentimes in the ministry of Jesus, he gives instructions to people when he wants to perform his miracle of restoration in their lives. Instructions like, rise, take your bed and walk. Damsel, I say unto you, arise. Lazarus, come forth. Go to the pool of Siloam and wash your eyes. Go to the priest and show yourself. What if those people refuse to obey that? What if the man sick of palsy refused to rise and walk? Does that mean Jesus doesn't have the power to restore his health? Of course not. The power, willingness, and ability on the part of Jesus aren't questionable. The only question we're left with now is, will you allow him? You allow the restoration power of Jesus to work in your life when you surrender to him when you truly let go of your struggles, agitations, and fears, when you lay everything naked before him and you are ready for restoration. Being prepared is not the end of the story. You need to ask him to restore all you have lost. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You need to pray a heartfelt prayer, a prayer of total dependence. When your prayer to God for restoration is from your heart, it will not miss the ears of God. When you need to praise him for his mighty power, put your faith to work and genuinely believe he has restored all you lost, even when you are yet to see it. Put his words in your lips, meditate on them in your heart, and always proclaim them whenever fear tries to come into your heart. You'll not have to do this for long before you see his mighty outstretched hand of restoration work mightily in your life. What the enemy has delayed for years, he can give them all back to you in an hour if only you believe. If only you could trust him. If only you could put your faith in his ability alone. I recently realized that the root cause of many of our worries and unsettledness is the thoughts of what will happen tomorrow, what should be and what ought not to be. For some, it is the thought of, how will I feed my family? And how will I pay the bills? What if I never scale through this issue? Dear child of God, please hold on a moment. Permit me to ask, since you've been thinking and having sleepless nights about all this, what has changed? What if our Lord Jesus even comes before tomorrow? You see, as long as we entertain these thoughts, we will lose our joy, peace, and stability. Anxiety is a thief. If it gets the opportunity, it will steal everything away from you, no matter how little. God gives us everything we need to live a godly life every day. Truth is, what we have today is what we need. If we do not have it, we may not need it, or the time is not right. I believe God wants us to live our lives free of worry. He wants us to focus on what we have now and be content with it. When we do this, our lives take a beautiful turn, which is usually unimaginable. It is a beautiful thing to trust God to the extent that you believe He will give you everything you need. It is more beautiful to rest in his promises, assured that if God has not given you that thing, you probably don't need it. Matthew 6, 25 through 30 says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? 
Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? That's the best antidote to worry in the scriptures. What Jesus is saying to you through this verse of the Bible is this. Worrying does not add anything to your life. It is a complete waste of time. The precious time you could have concentrated on finding a solution or even earning an extra income from a side hustle. Worrying makes you feel your situation is worse than anyone else's. It makes you look pathetic and you may even begin to have self-pity. Anxiety drains you of life and shuts your eyes against the possibility of a way out. In other words, it teaches you to be negative. Someone may ask, is it possible for anyone to live a worry-free life? With all the unpleasant and unexpected happenings in our world today, how can I take my mind off my needs? My first answer would be, yes, it is possible to live a worry-free life. You need to know the advantages you have in Christ Jesus. One of them is your freedom to cast all your cares on the master. It is not just a provision for you in Christ Jesus. It is a privilege that should not be taken for granted. A lot of people are inclined to go through life sad and depressed. This kind of life is not for the children of God. However, a good number of believers who do not know what they have in Jesus still live their lives as though they were unbelievers. They have an impaired perspective of life, often inspired by pain, disappointment, and frustrations. God does not want you to live your life like this. He wants your perspective of life to change. He wants you to be able to see things through the lens of the scriptures because that is when things will begin to change. Nothing works out fine for a man who is weighed down by the thoughts of what if and how. His mind has been trained to think negatively and he can barely see or notice when things begin to change positively. The word of God makes us understand that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You cannot want things to turn positive when you are full of negative energy. Worry is a negative energy and if you want things to change, you have to do away with it. Give it to God and watch things take a new turn. You will begin to see life as a worthwhile adventure when you lay all your anxieties at the foot of the cross. It becomes easy to take lack and every other challenge lightly when you cast your cares on the Lord. Jesus is calling out to you. It is an invitation to let off your loads. It is a call to let him care for you. He wants you to go through life with so much ease. He hates to see you weighed down by cares that should have been cast on him. Matthew 11, 28 through 30 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There's rest in God for your soul. There's a place where you can rid yourself of everything that hinders you from experiencing the rest God has promised you. This does not imply that there will be no more challenges. It only means that the cares are with the right person. They're with God. God has given you an assignment as a believer. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and every other thing shall be added unto you. You can't do this when your cares are always on you. The cares of this world are thorns that choke the word of God in your heart, preventing it from being fruitful and productive. Maybe you're wondering why you haven't been able to leverage the word of God. Maybe you're wondering why it looks like the word of God is not impacting you. The enemy may even whisper saying, you are not changing, just give up on listening to or reading the word of God. The reason why it seems like the word is ineffective is because you have so many cares. Someone said, the preaching of the gospel is useless to a man whose priority is to make a living or survive. All of these will change if you can give your worries to God. I understand that in the hustle and bustle of our daily lives, it's easy to find ourselves weighed down by worries and burdens. Our concerns can often feel overwhelming, leaving us feeling anxious, stressed, and lost. God sees us, and he understands how we feel. He does not expect us to keep any of these weights to ourselves. There's a profound level of faith we activate and an incredible transformation that occurs when we choose to give our worries to God. Imagine your worries as heavy stones that you've been carrying on your shoulders. They represent the doubts, fears, and uncertainties that burden your heart. Now picture yourself handing these stones over to a higher power, to God. 
As you release each one, a remarkable sense of relief washes over you. You feel a weight being lifted, and suddenly, the path ahead seems clearer and brighter. I like to give this illustration of a father and his child. When a child is born, he does not have to cater for himself. He does not think about how his diapers will get changed or how his unfitted clothes will get changed. He just trusts that these things will be taken care of somehow. This is why little children live the most peaceful lives on earth. They do not have to worry about anything. They do not try to take on their father's responsibilities. Matthew 28.3 says, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those with the heart like a child can put all their worries on God. God wants you to come to this point because it changes everything about your life. This is when you can rightly say that you're walking by faith and not by sight. If you're a parent, you may have to bear the worries of your children. You may have to bear your older partner's worries. But the thing is, you should not bear it alone. When they cast their cares upon you, expecting a response, you can turn to God and cast the same on Him. In this case, God wants you to receive and cast them on Him. When you entrust your worries to God, you make a powerful statement of faith and surrender. You acknowledge that there are forces greater than yourselves at play, and you're willing to let go of the need to control every aspect of your life. This act of faith opens the door to a world of possibilities. In that moment of surrender, you invite God's divine guidance and wisdom into your life. You acknowledge that you are not alone in your struggles and that there's a plan beyond your understanding. God's peace that surpasses all understanding only comes to you when you let go of every worry that could stir up feelings of unsettledness. Let go of your cares. In doing so, you are freeing up space in your heart and mind for hope, gratitude, and positive change. It is incredible how the removal of negativity can make room for positivity. Your perspective shifts and you start to notice the beauty and blessings that surround you. Your joy is restored and you will find a river of happiness flowing in your heart, irrespective of the situation. Your faith strengthens, paving the way to receive whatever you ask in Jesus' name. I believe God is sending you His word today. He's saying to you, give them all to me and I will open a door of transformation and miracles. Watch how things change as you relinquish control and place your trust in me. Dear beloved, the burdens that once held you down can be replaced with a sense of liberation and you will discover that the power of faith can move mountains. Your journey will be filled with unexpected blessings and you will find the strength and courage to overcome every obstacle when you give room for God's divine intervention. Do you know that worrying not only messes with your mind, but can also affect your physical health? It can lead to headaches, tummy troubles, and more serious health issues like heart problems. So why worry when it doesn't make things better? Instead, it adds to the problem at hand. Scripture has shown that what changes things is your trust in God. As a child of God, when you quit worrying and start trusting God, He will change your situation. Jesus was explaining in Matthew 6, 25-27, the reason you should trust Him. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Take a moment to think about the birds. They don't stress about where their next meal will come from, yet they soar freely in the sky, looking healthy. Why? Because God takes care of them. Now consider this. Unlike birds flying around, you have a purpose to fulfill on earth. Do you truly believe God would provide for them and let you go hungry when you were so important to Him? God's care for the birds is a simple reminder that He values you even more. You have a purpose and a role to play in this world. And God is not just aware of it, but is committed to providing for you. So as you grow through life, trust that as God takes care of the birds, He's watching over you with greater care.
What troubles are you facing? Is the state of the world making you anxious? Are you struggling to have enough food every day, or do you aspire for more? Maybe you feel tired of playing small because you believe there's more you can achieve. You're correct, but worrying won't solve it. Why not go to God in prayer? This is the first step to exchanging your worries for God's blessing. When things are tough, talking to God is a powerful way to find peace and solutions. Instead of stressing, share your concerns with Him. Let Him know your fears, desires, and dreams. God is a caring friend. He listens and understands. You don't need fancy words. Speak from your heart. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. The Bible tells us to cast all worries on God, not some of them. It's okay to tell Him everything you feel. Don't believe some things are too small or unimportant to share with God. He's interested in every aspect of your life, even the tiniest details. He knows the number of hairs on your head, so you can be sure He knows all your troubles. Even though God knows what you're going through, He wants you to give your worries to Him. Imagine a loving parent eagerly waiting to hear about their child's day, eager to offer guidance, support, and comfort. That's God with you. He's ready to listen, understand, and help you with whatever you're dealing with. So don't hesitate to share your concerns, big or small, with God. He cares about every part of your life and is always there to support you. In prayer, you find a refuge, a safe place where you can be honest about your struggles. It's like conversing with a trusted friend who has the power to help and comfort. God knows your needs, and when you bring them to Him, you are placing them in capable hands. Also, when you are in an impossible situation, Exercise your faith in him. In the Bible, there was a man known as the centurion. Jesus commended him for having the greatest faith in Israel. Here's why. The centurion had a servant who was very sick. When Jesus offered to go and pray for the servant, the centurion realized that he wasn't worthy to have Jesus in his house. However, he suggested an alternative to Jesus. He said, if you could just speak a word, my servant would receive his healing. What great faith! Do you have so much trust that you believe just a word from Jesus can make a sick person well? The faith of the centurion surprised Jesus, and you know what? The servant got healed without Jesus even going to the centurion's house. The centurion had every reason to get worried about a sick servant. But instead of letting fear take over, he believed in Jesus. You can be like him, trusting God no matter what you're facing. Have big faith, even when doubt tries to creep in. Focus on the God who can turn things around and let your trust in him be strong. Just like the centurion, your faith in God can make a real difference in your life. So choose to believe and let your hope in God be your strength. When you are dealing with God, You've got to believe in things that seem impossible. God can do anything. There's no limit to his power. But if you have doubts, it can sort of limit what God can do in your life. James chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. If you doubt, it's hard to get what you're asking for from God. When you have faith, then it is stable. You are telling God, I trust you. I believe you can do it. It's a way of opening yourself up to receive the good things God wants to give you. Remember, God works according to the level of faith you have in Him. So trust, believe, and expect great things from the Lord. In tough times, it's good to remember that others have faced difficult situations and have come out stronger. This is true both in the Bible and in our world. 
They've shared their experiences in books, offering valuable insights on overcoming challenges. These individuals are gifts from God to help you in your faith journey. When life hits hard, their stories and teachings can inspire and strengthen you. You can pick up their books or listen to their messages. Let their wisdom minister to you. They've been through tough times just like you and have learned valuable lessons along the way. The blessing of having these people in our lives is immense as they can provide encouragement, guidance, and practical advice on how to go through difficult seasons. So if you're going through a challenging time, don't hesitate to seek inspiration from the experiences and teachings of these spiritual leaders. Their words can bring comfort, hope, and valuable strategies for overcoming trials. Remember, you're not alone. The wisdom they share can be a source of strength on your journey of faith. Listening to spiritual leaders is good, but it doesn't replace the importance of studying God's Word for yourself. Meditating on God's Word is like soaking in faith. Romans 10.17 says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the Word of Christ. What you listen to affects your faith. If you're constantly hearing discouraging words, it can bring you down. But if you're soaking in God's reassuring words, it builds you up. In a world full of negativity, it's crucial to dive deep into God's Word. His Word is truth, and it has the power to change things. Spend time with the Bible and let it sink into your heart through meditation. The more you think about it, the more it becomes a light guiding you. God's Word is not just words on a page. It's a powerful force that can bring strength and positivity into your life. You must do everything possible to sow the seed of God's Word into your heart. Remember the parable of the sower. The farmer went out to his field to plant seeds. As he scattered the seeds, some fell on the path where people walked, some on rocky ground, some among thorns, and some on good soil. The seeds on the path didn't grow because birds ate them. The ones on rocky ground started to grow, but since the soil was shallow, they withered when the sun got hot. The seeds among thorns sprouted, but the thorns choked them so they couldn't produce much. However, the seeds in the good soil grew strong and healthy, producing a great harvest. Now the seeds represent God's word, and the different types of soil represent different people's hearts. Some people hear God's word, but it doesn't sink in like the seeds on the path. Others get excited about it, but lose interest when things get tough, like the seeds on rocky ground. Some hear the message, but let worries and distractions take over, like the seeds among thorns. But the ones with good hearts truly take in God's message, letting it grow and produce good things in their lives. Worries can make it hard for God's words to stick into your heart. The devil knows this, and he tries to snatch away God's word from your heart. When you hear something encouraging or a message from God, the devil tries to mess with it. He wants to pull out the good seed sown in your heart. But here's the thing. Don't let him do that. Let your heart be open and ready to accept and grow from what God tells you. Imagine your heart is like soil in a garden. When you plant God's word in it, let them stay and take root. Don't let worries or doubts pull them out. God wants you to have a good and amazing life. He's always on your side, wanting the best for you. But there's someone who doesn't like that, the devil. The devil tries to make things go wrong for God's children. The good news? God gave you the power to stand strong against the devil's tricks. So instead of worrying, it's time to stand up to your challenges. It's okay if you have lived a life of worry before. We all do. But you can't let worry control you forever. When you decide enough is enough, God steps in. Tell God you're tired of feeling sad and upset. It will surprise you how things that kept you down for a long time can suddenly disappear. 
God is super powerful and ready to change your story for the better. So no more worries. It's time for a positive change. Do you struggle to pray? Do you find it hard to shut the door and spend time in prayer? Do you find it more convenient to turn to your friends or coworkers during difficult times instead of going on your knees to communicate with God? That's a sign that something is wrong. There is already a spiritual issue at hand. And if you don't recognize the game the devil is playing, you might find yourself lost amidst the chaos. Prayer is a powerful weapon that God has given every believer to face any situation in life. Refusing to use this weapon is like shooting yourself in the leg. Going about your tasks without wielding your sword to confront the challenges in your life limits you. It prevents you from receiving what God wants for you. It's like a soldier heading to the war front, leaving behind his gun, sword, shield, armor, and everything at home. That's what it's like to go about your day without prayer. Facing the day without prayer is akin to venturing into the snow without clothes. It is essentially self-destructive. Have you ever wondered why Jesus began his earthly ministry with prayer? After John publicly declared him as the Lamb of God, he spent 40 days and nights in the wilderness, praying and fasting. He was preparing himself for the work he had to do. Right before the pinnacle of his earthly assignment, what did he do? He went to Gethsemane and prayed. While the disciples slept, he prayed with great anguish of soul, and his sweat dripped from his body like blood. Jesus is the Word of God from heaven. He had been with God since the beginning of creation, but when he came to earth for his assignment, he didn't sideline prayer. He understood the importance of prayer and recognized that without this powerful weapon, he would not be able to fulfill his ministry. Mark 1.35 Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Despite his busy life, he didn't get caught up in the paparazzi or forget about prayer. Dear child of God, what makes you think you can successfully go through life, overcome the devil, have all the blessings of God, and be triumphant in death without prayer? Whatever made you think prayer was an option? What made you think you could be too busy to pray and life will continue to go smoothly? The oil lubricating your wheel making the drive smooth and hassle-free, is prayer. Once you stop it, it's only a matter of time before the engine becomes dry and eventually stops. Prayer keeps your spirit man awake and alert. You already know the world is full of evil. The evil you can see, the ones you perceive, and the ones you do not see or perceive. How do you know if someone is plotting your downfall? How will you know the right way to react, what to do, and where to go when everything in your life turns upside down? Without prayer, you will become lost in the crowd, lost in the ocean of pain and anguish. That is why you need to go back to the place of prayer. Your relationship with God depends on how much time you spend with Him in prayer. You love God. You want to live for Him. You want the whole of your life to glorify Him, you say but you don't spend time getting to know him. When you just met your spouse, he or she was just a random stranger like every other person. But you built a relationship. You spent time together, talked, laughed, shared happy and sad moments together. And that was the foundation of your love. How then do you claim to love God and not spend time with him? How come you claim to love God but are too busy for him? You always find it burdensome when your conscience pricks you that you haven't prayed. Then you quickly mumble words together. You are constantly falling under every temptation the devil throws at you because you have not fortified yourself with prayers. The Bible says in Psalm 91.1, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. You are not dwelling in the shelter of the Most High when you do not pray. 
and that is why you cannot rest under his shadow. That is why every arrow from the enemy gets to you. That is why the weight of every attack of the devil pushes you down. That is why the devil is able to fill your mind with various negative thoughts that breed fear in you. If you are confused about what to do, where to go, and what will become of your life, it's because you are yet to spend time with God. When you spend time with God in prayer, He will give you the blueprint of your life. You will try to be like everyone else because you will already know who you are. However, you cannot know who you are when you are too busy to stay with the one who has made you. Your heart won't be enlarged enough to grasp the dimension of the revelation of your destiny to walk in it. While many people are confused and agitated, the one who prays would hear a voice behind him telling him, this is the way to go and you should walk therein. That will foster your speed in life as you don't have to wait in confusion at any crossroads. You see people being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. They don't seem to have any backbone or even a mind of their own. They don't know what is right or wrong and would often shift based on the environment they find themselves in. That is because they have not built capacity in prayer. They have not spent enough time with God to become rooted in Him. They are just like a plant grown in a greenhouse and suddenly exposed to harsh weather. That plant will not be able to stand because its root is still shallow. Do you seek blessings from God? Well, why don't you ask Him? Do you seek healing for your body? God holds the key to heal you. Do you seek answers to certain questions about your life? Go to the maker of life and destiny. Everything you want in life, you can get through prayer. Great possibilities await those who take prayer seriously. As powerful as prayer is, it is not all kinds of prayer that yield power before God. Some prayers sound like a broken record for just one reason, because those who pray do not believe that God can answer them. The Bible tells us in James 1.5, if any one of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Faith is the ingredient that seals your prayer and makes it irresistible. Jesus is your perfect example. So you need to learn from his lifestyle of prioritizing prayer and do the same. He created time for prayer amidst his busy schedule. And you should also do the same. You can achieve so much more when you put prayer at the forefront of your life's endeavors. When you see prayer as what it truly is, the reason you breathe and are still alive, you will not want to stop praying. No one forces anyone to breathe in the air. We all know that without it, life would leave us. Prayer is the air of your spiritual life. You should not forget that the spiritual controls every other aspect. So when you refuse to breathe and are gasping for survival, every other aspect of your life will react to that almost dead state. A person who goes on without praying for a long time will eventually experience spiritual death. Your life's objective is to remain alive in spirit and soul, and your spirit will come alive at the scent of water. Praying according to the will of God takes your prayer to a higher level. Praying the word of God back to him will give you a speedy answer to your requests. Heaven and earth will pass away but no part of his word will go without being fulfilled. And he honors his word more than his name, ensuring that none of his word falls to the ground. Beloved, that is the power of backing your prayers with the word of God. Beloved, find rest in God's presence from all the troubles of the world because you can obtain everything you are looking for from God and he alone can give you everything pertaining to life and godliness. Daniel lived a life of prayer. A wonder his life was remarkable and a book of the Bible was even named after him. The officials tried to find something against him, but they found nothing. 
He excelled in everything he did, and the only thing they could hold against him was his prayer life. Those people were not his friends, but they knew he prayed. Although you should not pray to show or impress others, do the people around you know that you pray? Does your spouse know you pray? Do your children ever see you pray or even pray with them? Daniel's prayer shut the mouth of the lions. He received revelations of future events and enjoyed deep favor from God because he prayed. Esther's prayer changed the death sentence upon her and her people, and they went from being rejected to becoming a ruling power in the land of their captivity. Beloved, it is time to return to the place of prayer. It is time for you to understand that without prayer, it would be impossible for you to live a victorious life. The Bible says in the book of James, Is anyone among you sick? Let them pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let them sing praise. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. Your prayer is what stands between you and the blessings you desire. Everything you want from God can be yours and much more when you learn to pray. Make it a point of duty to pray always and without ceasing, as an act of obedience to God's command and as a sign of your love, loyalty, and complete dependence on God. Take the time to seek God in prayer, for it is through prayer that you will find strength, guidance, and protection. It is through prayer that you will develop a deep and intimate relationship with your Heavenly Father. Don't neglect the power of prayer, for it is the key to living a victorious and fulfilling life in Christ. May you find solace and strength in the presence of God through fervent prayer.